Here we are at the Ampex picnic. Yeah, having a good time already. Come on over here and instrumentation. I'll, I'll interview you shoot. Okay. It was a wide band with instrumentation recorder. Okay. So this was this was 19 This is 19 when it, 1966 when okay. I first showed up there. Yeah, a wide band with instrumentation recorder that recorded uh, uh, it was an electron beam, okay. So we had a, a electron gun, mechanical gun, okay. And then we had 35 millimeter silver halide film, okay, that the electron beam would expose, the, the energy for the beam would expose the film, okay, and it was a track, a serpentine track that went across the film, back and forth, back and forth, back and oh, forth. Oh, data, data recorder. Yeah, it was a data recorder. Okay. So then we, in, we modulated the, the grid of the tube to intensity modulate the exposure on the film, okay? So you got light areas and dark areas. This is all analog in those days. Okay? Right. So to play it back, the, Kodak made this film for us. They had a, a coating on the bottom of the film called a scintillator, okay? So when we played it back, we played it back with a constant intensity beam, okay? And then it would modulate the beam, which would modulate the scintillator. The scintillator would convert the energy from the electrons into light. Then we had a photomultiplier tube that would pick up this intensity modulation signal and convert it into an electrical signal. Okay. Do you remember anything about the the, the, the statistics in terms of how many line pairs per millimeter? Yeah, it's or anything been a long like time. I don't remember what, that. What was the application? It was it was all uh, government funded. Okay. Yeah. And. Uh, the reels were in vacuum, okay, there was okay. a big, and, and the, we had, you know, vacuum pumps for the gun, which is high vacuum, oil diffusion pumps, and then the reels were in a lower vacuum, and I, I can't remember what the, the transition was between the high vacuum and the low vacuum, but the reels had just a, a, a rotary oil pump, okay, so, so to change the reels you'd have to, you know, Take the vacuum out so you can open the door and then pump it down before you could use it. Okay. And of course, when you when you made this track, you had to play it back and you needed to have the, the beam servo to follow this track. Okay. So I worked on the servoing of, of the beam on playback to follow the track. And we used the, the dither process where you dither back and forth across the track and you can find the center of the track. Okay. okay. So it got to the point where um, we actually uh, this is again through the government. We actually put one of these on an Air Force reconnaissance airplane. And what they would do, they'd go out over Russia to light up all these uh, radar sites, okay? And then, this is a Boeing 707 full of electronics gear, no okay. seats, okay? And what they would do, they'd go over near Russia to light up the, the SAM missile sites, okay? They wouldn't be shooting at them, but right, enough but to get they try to map the sites. They would, and then all these receivers then would record the IF frequency of, of the radar onto this tape not tape film, okay, yeah. then they could play it back and, and analyze it and try to figure out how to work around it, okay. Hmm. And it got to the point where I went over to England for three months and supported this group that would f fly out to Russia and back. And also, when we first prepared it, uh, we, we mounted, the, this was a huge machine, okay, and they mounted it in the cargo door, cargo door of the airplane, okay. and we flew it around the United States for a while, so I went on a couple of missions around, we would fly from the east coast to the west coast, the east coast to the west coast, you know, 15 hours, air refueling was fun, you know. And then you had to develop it. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> Slosh chemicals, uh -huh. and then put it back in the, in the machine to play it back. Oh! So you, you, All in high just, vacuum? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and you had so to dry it. So you had it. to excite it with the electron beam on replay in order to get the image off. Yeah, well, what happened is you'd have this intensity modulated track on, on, the, on the film that, during the record process. Right. And therefore, uh, on playback, you know, the, the scintillator, the, the beam, uh, the, on playback was a constant level of beam would, would light up the scintillator, mm -hmm. which would convert the electron energy into light energy, yeah. so we'd have intensity modulated right. light, but, which would go into a photomultiplier right. tube, and then could, would then make an electrical signal. But if, if, the, the, if the electron beam was intensity modulated in the first place, during record, during record, why couldn't you just scan the lines and pull that off without having to go through that process again? But the thing is, on playback, you had to guide the electron beam on the original track. Ah, so it was a tracking thing. It was a tracking thing. So, oh. so you, you, you worked on this as, as a servo engineer? Yeah, kind of a servo engineer, right. What was the biggest challenge in that? 
Uh, well, there was two challenges. One, to get the beam to, to, to track the track, and also we had the time base corrected, you know, just like in a video recorder, okay? okay? So we had servos that also, besides keeping the beam on the track, that, that would time base correct the playback, okay? So we had, had two things going on there. Okay. And so I worked on that till about 72, and then uh, the guy that hired me originally, I you ever heard of the name of Dave Feibusch? Name David K. Fibish. Yeah, he was a good friend of mine. What was uh, just one more thing? Was there a name for this product? Electron you, beam recorder. Just EBR. Ampex EBR. EBR. Okay. Right. All right. So you, you you moved into the video. Today. Yeah, and because Dave Fibush went into the video department, and he said, "Why don't you come work for me?" So I did. And then I the first my first project was cleaning up the audio on the AVR2. In fact, Bill Carpenter has a board over there that I worked on. And when I somebody by the name of Bob Harshberg had worked on it and he left or something and I, so I finished the project. And then that was done. I started working on the audio for the AVR3 and just barely got started. And then the fellow that came from Cartridge Vision, Dick Hathaway, I don't know if you know the name. He was a mechanical engineer for, for yeah. Cartridge Vision. He, they, at that time, they were trying to re revamp the, the, the Ampex Type A format. It, is, it didn't interchange worth a damn. Okay? And so he had this idea of having a movable head that, that would help interchange. So if the interchange was off, that this head would follow the track so you could play it back. And I had this experience in servoing on the electron beam recorder, so I applied that to moving heads. And, then we suddenly realized that, well, if you can track it on a normal speed, you can also now make the video recorder play slow motion, okay? Mm -hmm. So we got into, you know, playing variable speed with the AST system. So I worked yeah. on the AST system for the... So t talk to me a little bit about how you, the, the, the steps that you went through to, to get from, gee, this is an idea, to this is actually kind of coming along, to it's an, imp an idea we can implement, give a product name, and it's on a yeah, machine. Yeah, first we built a prototype on an old... Type A system to, to, to prove the concept and showed it to management and, and that you know that we could play slow motion and they were very impressed. So they put a lot of money into it, yeah. okay, to develop for. And, and, and who was involved in it in the early stages? There was you. There was uh, myself. And Jim Wheeler was over here. He yeah. was involved in yeah. that. And, and Dick Hathaway was involved in that. And I did kind of the electronics and the servo and thing. Dick Hathaway did the mechanical design. In those days, the head was deflected with the piezoelectric effect, where right. you had a high voltage right. power supply that. And also there was a feedback strip on the side because the head was a cantilever thing that if, mm -hmm. if you didn't dampen it would just sit there and ring. So we had to have some feedback to electronically dampen it. Right. And there was a little sensor strip on the side that gave a voltage back that I worked on a little servo circuit to, to dampen it. And uh, so then that was the VPR1. And then uh, we applied it to the VPR2, which was a Type-C format, and then I also worked on the AST for the VPR3, okay? okay. 